My name is Frederick Eklein. I'm the CEO of founder of Enevo. It's a company that is changing waste management to a demand-based model. So traditionally, waste management is, is uh, and waste collection operations is done statically. So let's say you have a city with uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of uh, waste containers. And uh, they're collected every day, every hour, every week, same static route and schedule. So what we do is that we actually put sensors inside waste containers. And then, OK, excellent. So I'll skip a few slides. OK. Retry. So waste collection is done statically. So collecting basically every day, every, every hour, every, every week, you know, regardless if the containers are full or not. So basically, it's driving from container to container blindly. And this is something that, I mean, people don't get. It, it's something that happens in the background. We don't pay attention to this at all. And uh, it's hugely inefficient. It's like having a taxi driver going from door to door, knocking on the door. Hey, is there anybody who wants to, to drive uh, to another location? And still getting paid for this, even if there's a, 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 a uh, client looking for a ride or not. Well, what we figured out that, hey, it would be good to know where to go and when to go. So we put sensors inside containers so we know exactly when we need to go and collect the container. So there's no need to go and collect a container that is going to be full in a week or you know, a few days from now. So it's better to go and collect only when there is true demand. So as said, we put sensors inside the waste containers. They send wireless the data into our servers. And we do very advanced uh, predictive analytics on, on figuring out when the container is going to get full and calculate an optimal route and, and schedule and what kind of fleet and resources are needed to collect that service area. So traditionally, we have like operations managers uh, running a fleet of, let's say, two, 300 trucks in a city. And uh, they do manual planning day to day, all the time, and figuring out where to go. And, and, uh, and uh, our servers basically do everything automatically. So there's one guy sitting in the city and managing the whole city's waste uh, collection operations. Everything happens automatically in the most optimal way. They're able to track where the trucks are moving, and so So quickly about the company. Everything we do is, is a service. So we provide hardware as a service, software as a service. And uh, we're about 70 people right now, growing quite rapidly. And the business model is a subscription, traditional SaaS model. And uh, so far, second half of this year, we've really been accelerating. So we're growing month to month about 20% revenues, which is quite, quite good. We have regional offices in some of the more mature markets that we're focusing on, North America, UK, and, and so on. We have also a very good team. I built uh, the company originally with myself and my co-founder. We were two guys in a garage, and now we're like 72 people in the company and expect to be double that size next year. And we have a world-class management team with startup and IPO experience as well under their belt. So far, we've raised about $26 million of, of venture money. This is a slow-moving but very, very large market. So waste management, it's a, it's a trillion euro market. It's about six times larger annually than the cell phone business. So it's, it's something that people don't really understand and think about. So some of the customers we have, North America, big cities, skyline of Pittsburgh here, New York City is a customer, Baltimore, Boston. It's something that most of you will never see or even think about, but it's our system that is running automated demand-based waste collection in these cities. 
Same thing in the UK. We have about 20 city councils working with us, two London boroughs already, and Europe, some of the big, big uh, famous cities, Barcelona, Antwerp, so on. So, it's an example of what we did in the city of Rotterdam. They did paper collection in the city five days per week. We're now able to cut down that to, to three days. They get the exact same amount of tonnage in, and they can be provide a better service to their customers and uh, just cutting cut down costs. It's quite, quite remarkable savings, changing from a static to a demand-based. There's a lot of discussion about demand-based logistics and, and things like that. This is a closed environment, and, and uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm just super excited every day when I see our customers saving money and providing better service. So interesting, the media wrote about us last year. Very, I don't know if this is, this is a good thing or a bad thing, but at least it, uh, it uh, put some, put some uh, comedy to the whole thing. Everybody talks about Internet of Things. We're, we're, we're now known for being the guys who are in the Internet of Shit. And it's people at least they remember us now and they know. So so that's that's uh, that's basically it. The best and the brightest from the Nordics. Internet of shit. Thank you. As a uh, failed musician, this is probably the largest audience I will ever perform in front of. Um, and the team who watches me back home in Stockholm, hello guys. Uh, I'm actually really, really nervous. I hope that doesn't show too much. But I'm also super humbled to have Soundtrack Your Brand nominated as one of the hottest tech startups in the Nordics. We're super humble about it, and we're also super proud. My name is Andreas Lifgarden, and between 2008 and 2012, I did business development for Spotify, and I helped take Spotify from 20 people to somewhat 1,000-ish people. My co-founder of Soundtracker Brand is a guy named Ola Sars. Uh, he happened to co-found a company called Beats Music, that just recently got acquired by Apple. So I think we, we know something about the music industry that will take us somewhere. We got investors like Norzone, Wellington, Xandum, uh, Spotify included, and also Telia Sonora, which we're really proud of. What we do is actually quite simple. You walk into a store, you hear music. That's what we do. Our product lineup is really not that hard to understand. We got a system that a brand DJ can remotely control thousands of locations in retail chains. We got a box that we put in every retail location that is foolproof. It doesn't hang itself, and if it does, it'll restart itself. It can go offline and still keep on playing music. It has no buttons. Imagine that, and it still works. Plug in Ethernet, plug in audio, you're good to go. Consumers can interact with our platform. Staff can interact with it and change music. And we also have built an API that will, will basically, for the first time in history of Insta Music, allow the sun is shining, let's play happy music. Rain is here, November is here in Helsinki, let's do sad music, let's do tango. If you're, if you're a customer or if you're a staff, this is our iPhone app that you would use, for example. If you are a customer eating your burger, you could look at the beautiful screen showing the music playing. And if you're the brand DJ, this is the admin interface that you would be using to remotely control all of your retail chain. Uh, the team that built this, and I'm really, 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 really proud of our team. 
we got a team of developers, 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 and also some creative people. For example, we have Carl, who used to be the CTO of Frostbite. And you may have played some of his games, uh, like FIFA, and you may have played Call of Duty, and you will certainly play the next Star Wars game that he helped develop. We got Henrik, and he did the content ID system for YouTube. We got at least two professional singers on staff, myself not included, uh, Sabina, who was in the Idol finals, and we got people from iSettle and Klarna. So we got a really, really good team of 42 people that I'm really proud of to be working with. Now, what is a good team, what is a good product, unless you have a great product? Let's talk about McDonald's and the problem we're solving for them. McDonald's serves 70 million people every day. And you know what? Their chief digital officer, Atif Rafiq, he has a significant problem. Because when he's at home, he's enjoying Netflix, he's enjoying Spotify, he's enjoying YouTube and all of the other digital services that has completely transformed media over the last 10, 15 years. But when he goes to work, he plays CD for his customers. We're looking at a part of the music industry that God completely forgot. Somebody didn't tell the in-store music industry that the CD was dead. 70% of all retail stores still play physical media. And we're looking at an industry completely undisrupted by digital, and we want to change that. Also, digital changes not only distribution, it also changes sales, how something is sold. And everything in our little part of the industry is direct sales. There's no online sale, there's no long tail, and we want to change that. Because, if you think about it, as enterprises, we use things like Salesforce and Gmail and Dropbox, but have you ever met them in person? We want to be the company that sells to enterprises online. In terms of market size, the served available market today is around a million locations and a billion dollars. The total available market, if you would apply digital distribution and digital technology, is something like 10 million locations and 10 billion in turnover. In Sweden, where we launched 10 months ago, we have already acquired 15% market share. Also, I don't believe growth is going to stop at $10 billion. I think there's more to it. Because if you think about it, 20 years ago, we got devices and we got connectivity. That in turn gave us companies like eBay, YouTube, Netflix, Facebook, Spotify, Google, and so on and so on. It is only now when the retail environment is going digital and when they will get broadband and when they will get Internet of Things and devices, in-store media providers like ourselves will hopefully be and fulfill the promise of being the next cool tech startup from the Nordics. Also, there's another trend going on here. All of the music startups are fighting for the consumer dollar, the consumer uh, wallet. There's $15 billion to fight for, and they're all going to these companies here. We are relatively alone in what we do. On the global scene, there are only two providers of in-store media that has scale today. So when we take the $550 billion that brands spend every year, and they say, we want to transform our retail environments into digital out-of-home inventory, we are uniquely positioned to take part of that growth as well. So let me start summarizing this. B2B is completely greenfield. One. Soundtrack a brand brings disruption. Disruption in terms of sales and disruption in terms of distribution. There is additional growth within B2B when re retail is being digitized. When bought media is transformed into owned media and digital out of home, we are uniquely positioned to deliver the radio station of retail. Also, there's a lot of talk about business models these days. Freemium this and freemium that. We are a horse's common sense business model. We sell a store, we earn money. We are B2B software as a service with stable, recurring revenue, which I find to be really, really attractive these days. 
a little bit about what we have achieved over the past 10 months when we've been commercial. We outsell our competition by factor 25. If we send out 10 proposals, we'll get seven of them back with a signature. And our rolling 12-month recurring revenue has developed 4.5x. With that, I'm only con going to conclude that I think we got the fastest ship in the galaxy. We got the team. We got the product market fit. And we're definitely ready to scale. Thank you very much. I'm Mons Ulvestam, the founder and CEO of Acast. I'd like to apologize for putting a buzzword disruption on the very first page. Uh, I promise I won't use growth hacking or pivot. Uh, I don't have to use growth hacking because Acast user acquisition cost is actually zero. And I don't have to use pivot either because we had revenue from day one. So what do we do? We're a hosting and distribution and a monetization platform for podcasts. If I asked you if you listen to podcasts, you'd probably say yes, but that's because this room is full of tech people. Uh, but what happened in the last few years is that the podcasting media actually exploded due to broader content coming out. It used to be tech, tech podcasters doing tech podcasts for tech people. But as you may be aware of, there is now an actual mass media. So if you look at the way podcasting used to work, you need four or five different services to publish your podcast. The only way to monetize it would be if you had a sponsorship that you read into your podcast. It gets hard-coded in the sound file, and you can't change it. And for the advertiser, that means that they can't have current messages and they can't track it. So obviously, we saw this ecosystem ripe for disruption. So ACOS is the one-stop shop that does everything that the functional mass media should have been like from the start. If you look at the podcasting ecosystem, you have three stakeholders. First, you have the content creators, then you have the listeners, and then you have the advertisers. So the content creator obviously wants one simple system where they can see all of their metrics, where they can upload their file, and where they get paid. Acast is also the innovator of enriched podcast. This means that the content creator can actually drag and drop digital media into the podcast feed. So you get pictures, videos, links, additional content. Patent pending, by the way. So if you look at the listener, they want a fine podcast, and they want recommendations, and they want it to be easy. And if they find something they like, they might want to share it. So with ACOS, you can share not just the whole podcast, you can share a moment. So if you find something interesting 15 minutes into a show, you could share that with one click. <coughs> Sorry. Finally, the advertiser. Obviously, they want real metrics. They want third-party verification, and they want dynamic advertising. So with ACOS, they get all of that. So we can monetize a podcaster's whole back catalog, which, by the way, unlocks 30% extra inventory. We can do this with dynamic advertising on third-party platforms. So if you listen to an ACOS-enabled podcast, you'll get ads, whether it's on iTunes, Overcast, different Google Play apps, or obviously the ACOS app. We can also do dynamic 
sponsorships because that's the way it's always been done. So the media, the media buyers, they're kind of slow to get it. So we still sh sell show red sponsorships, but obviously the dynamic. So you can say Christmas is coming up, get your Christmas shopping done early. We're also introducing programmatic buying in podcast, which is also a novelty. We launched the service April 24th, 25th last year. And I got a final slide. It's directed to the investors. And as you can see, investors, they like numbers and boring slides. So 17%, the first number, is the number of Americans that actually listened regularly to podcasts in the beginning of this year. 36% is the year-on-year -year growth of podcast listenings. And 30% is the amount of time you actually spend listening to podcasts if you are a podcast listener. OK, so how does this compare? If you compare it to Spotify or Pandora, that's a 12%. So if you become hooked on podcasts, you spend three times as much time on that as you do on streaming music. 24 million is the amount of monthly listenings that we now monetize on Acast. And I spared uh, one minute for the next presenter. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Andrew Stalvo. I'm the CEO at Seriously. I co-founded the company two years ago with Finnish game veteran Petri Jarvaleto. And a year ago, with the support of a super talented team of people that have worked at companies like 20th Century Fox, Natural Motion, Rovio, Remedy, we launched our first game, Best Fiends. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit today about the first year and some of our plans for the future. So our strategy is to build the Pixar of mobile. We saw a huge opportunity to be incredibly creative on both our product development and on our marketing. To that end, we have a brilliantly talented team of product developers here in Helsinki, and then we have our business development and marketing out in Los Angeles. We felt like we could make a really terrific creative difference if we thought about the story, the world, the characters, and introduced them into the, into the media business through an app on mobile platforms. To, do, to that end, we focused on bringing on board some of the really great creative talent, like Hator Pereira, who also composed the music for Despicable Me and composed the music in our game. He was here earlier today talking about his process. What's exciting about the opportunity that mobile offers developers is we get to be directly connected to our audience. We were thinking about this earlier today when Fox, my old company, has a, has a franchise called Ice Age. And every three years, they come out with a new movie. For us, at Best Fiends, we're updating the game every three weeks. It's a live service with new content constantly coming. And the app is the hub for our IP. The great opportunity about mobile is you get to marry the creativity with the data. And we started realizing that our game was fun when we saw two stats, one on the retention and second on engagement. When we started a year ago, we didn't care at all about monetization. We just cared about building a product that was fun because we felt we could build ultimately a business around that. Our day one retention is best in class at over 60%. And now we're seeing over a million hours of gameplay in our app every single day. 
And I'm very thankful to Badger Spot here. I love this review. We'll give it five stars if I could actually stop playing it. I've wasted days in my pajamas while, while life goes on around me. So I, while I would encourage you all to download Best Fiends, watch out, it's quite addictive. We've made a strong start, but really this is just the beginning. We're over 21 million downloads now and adding between 50 and 60 more every minute. We did 150,000 at the weekend. And we've been quite systematic in our approach to building the game. The amazing opportunity for developers is this isn't a product anymore, it's a service. So we update the game consistently with new content, new characters, new worlds, special levels, events, promotions, tying it in with marketing. And our metrics are getting better as we're seeing how to more efficiently bring the game out to the audience. We're now seeing 35 minutes of gameplay per player a day, which is really, really exciting because it's great engagement with our brand. A million hours of gameplay a day, if you extrapolate that over a week, puts us up there with the biggest television shows in the US in terms of, hourly, in terms of weekly viewing. And this is an IP that we've built and created ourselves and own. But it's really, really tough out there. Just looking at this room, everyone here has got an app. And you've got to market this thing crazy well when you see that you've got some early product performance. We saw the prices of performance marketing escalating through the roof a year ago. So we asked the CMOs of our competitors what platforms weren't working for them to acquire downloads. Everybody came back and said YouTube doesn't work. So we accepted the challenge. We've been really, really focused on affinity and social marketing on YouTube as the core of our marketing efforts. I'll give you an example. Six weeks ago, we launched a mobile treasure hunt with 13 of the world's biggest YouTubers, with collectively 60 million subscribers. We they all launched a video, 13 of these guys and girls launched a video on one day and drove a ton of video views all saying, download Best Fiends, I've hidden my logo in the game. If you find all the logos, you get to unlock content, a free character, and you win diamonds and gold bars in the game. It drove a ton of usage, took our daily player base up 40 50%, and was a great way for us to market in a way that drives affinity. We're starting to think about ourselves more and more as a digital beats, and how can we find ways for people to really become our CMO? As a company, we set things up two years ago, and we wanted to do the right thing as a company. When we established the game, we said we wanted differentiated free-to-play that allows people to play the game all the way through, whether or not you want to pay. We felt that was the right thing to do. And the same in some of our marketing and partnerships. We got approached at the beginning, when we, when we launched Best Fiends, to do a whole load of uh, licensing partnerships with t-shirts and caps and the whole thing. And we actually turned it all down and we said, we're going to focus wholly on our product. And the only partnership we did was with a charity that's close to our hearts called Malaria No More. And it was pretty organic because in our game, we have a mosquito and he's given up blood drinks coconut water uh, from a scuba tank on, the, uh, on his back, very embarrassed about his, his former blood-sucking ways. And we drive people every day. When they get to level 17, Edward pops up and there's a link. You can win diamonds, learn more. We drive more people every day to Malaria No More's uh, co-branded uh, mobile page from, from our game than they've ever had in any other marketing campaigns they've done. And they've worked with American Idol. So we're really, really proud of this. We've got lots and lots of stuff coming soon. We try and do less things really well. Over the next year, we'll be launching in Asia, uh, in Korea, in China on Android, in Japan. We got off to a great start in China already. Um, and we see a lot of potential for our characters, our gameplay, and our world over there. We're excited about working on animated shorts. And we're bringing out two new games as well in the world of Best Fiends. We think this is a great franchise that we can build and build, and have set it up to be a story with a great conflict and contrast. 
And our creative marketing is going to get better and better. I've actually been up since four in the morning closing a deal on something we're doing before the end of the year. And we're really excited about challenging ourselves to be as creative as we are in the game, as we are in marketing, to cut through in what is ultimately one of the most competitive industries in the world. So with that, that's a kind of little summary of where we were at with Best Fiends over the first year. Hopefully, you guys will invite us back next year and we'll be able to show how we get on since then. But thanks very much for your time. Okay, my name is Johan. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Kahoot. Uh, I have a superpower, it's called dyslexia. And I started Kahoot with uh, three other guys, Martin, Jamie, and Osman. This is funny, I was, all, I was actually promised a beer if the music wasn't playing. Okay, so Kahoot, what is Kahoot? What makes Kahoot the fastest growing learning brand in the world? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now. This is what principals around the world is calling the sound of learning. So when the principals are walking into schools and they hear music booming out with screams from classrooms, they now call this the sound of learning, and I'll tell you why. Because for Halloween, the platform changes, and it's like this. For Christmas, the platform changes, and it's like this. For Bob Marley's birthday, it changes, and it's like this. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about 100 million people globally creating, playing, sharing 8 million learning games. Not just in classrooms, but beyond, and I'll show you. This is what we call cause and effect. We chose a very simple game that everyone knows to get market entry, the quiz show. The quiz show is an amazing learning tool if it's used for learning and teaching, and it's a bit awful if it's used for testing. When it's for learning, you get that reaction. When you have that reaction, you're captured the room, you're captured teaching, you're captured students, and you can move on. So what does that look like for us? It looks like 20 million active students every month, and we're growing, and we're growing, and we're growing. That's 20 million active students playing in classrooms. Why? Well, it's because play is our first language. It's about empathy, it's something that we were born with to connect with others. And then it's the play side of it, which is how we rumble and tumble, we learn about the world. What Kahoot is focused on is the social play. So the social play is when you have a setting like this, a classroom, that is a lot of people in one room, but you are not maximizing the potential. Chucking in digital pacifiers is not the solution, but it's the beginning. So what you do is you get teachers to creating Games, we have million teachers making games for learning. They can also go in and find four million publicly made games by uh, other teachers and users, which is also students. And the result is you have three billion answers like this. An answer on Kahoot is a physical exercise. But these kids are doing equations in South Africa, and they have anticipation, they're actually working together for it, and they're celebrating the victory. That's the play of Kahoot. Kahoot means doing something together slightly naughty. They just solved an equation. And that's the reaction you have on Kahoot. Three billion times so far. The good thing is once they've done that, they then start making their own learning games. This is the essence of Kahoot. The students are motivated to go and make their own learning games to enable peer-to-peer -peer learning. And what it really means is sometimes starts on paper, then they move over to the, to the computer. They, they research, they find the right questions, the wrong answers, the right answers, and then they put the challenge back to the other students, just like any other game where you have become the host of the game. Millions of students now are making these games to challenge others. Then they share it, and not just share the game, they also share the emotion of the game. So these are Twitter videos and images of teachers and students celebrating that they're playing together. And we are totally undervalued in learning the emotional side of learning. That's actually about connecting with others. You guys are here to learn about technology, to learn about whatever you're going to do in the future, and you come together. We do exactly the same in the classroom. We're maximizing the time of people coming to the classroom. 
So our mission is to make people into game creators, to set challenges for the classroom and beyond. Now, that is the biggest mission for us, which is the same way that you guys have all been pro professional photographers through Instagram, Snapchat, iMovie making you the video makers. We're on the same journey to make students and learners into game creators. And you have to start with a quiz, and you're going to end up with a very, very advanced and fun gaming culture, which is made by us, me, the dyslectic guy making a game for someone who's an expert in nanophysics. So how does that unfold? Well, it doesn't just have to be in the classroom. Here you have uh, the same students who we saw were doing equations. They were actually playing against the classroom in Norway. They were actually screencasting the game and playing against each other. The other thing we've seen is that people have done it on Twitch. Twitch, 127 classrooms in a live game against each other, district-wide. So of course, gaming doesn't have to be just restricted to the classroom. We know that from other gaming experiences, where you have nodes of 20, 20, 20. So of course, for us, as we're bringing this beyond the classroom, why not take an accounting class and connect it with an accounting firm and play it out? Why not do this? 3,000 seniors in Norway playing a game of Kahoot to learn about the internet. That is probably the most exciting thing we've seen about going beyond the classroom. That's the grandparents of the same children as in school. And they have, pa they have children who are in corporates. So when we talk about making people game creators, we mean everywhere in the world for learning. And I think this speaks for it all. Pensionists playing a game of Kahoot. Thank you. Du heter Maja. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lasse, CEO and co-founder of Pedit. How did you sleep last night? No. You didn't. Well. Bedit has helped thousands and thousands of people around the world to achieve more with a great night's sleep. And that's where we are going to proceed also in the future. But we've come a long way, so we want to remind you where we started. So few scientists in the university lab with the most robust and most sensitive sensor technology in the world and the really good understanding of the niche scientific medical method called ballistocardiography. So how to make business out of that? So we started to enter the consumer market, adding our sensors into the beds. So to the consumer beds to track health and sleep we started to focus in consumer market in 2012. We made an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign in 2013. We raised over half a million worth of paid pre-orders, and we started shipping the product in January 2014. Since that, we've opened several channels. We have thousands of point of sales, thousands of stores selling our products around the world. And we've uh, made some great partnerships, like uh, co-branding partnership with Misfit Wearables. And uh, right now, we are, have become, from that bunch of engineers, to the one recognized sleep tracking brand in the world. So this is what we are today. Hopefully, you can see the difference in the video. Monitoring your sleep quality has never been this easy. Just place the bed at sleep monitor on your bed under the bed sheet. Use Bedit and its smart features together with your mobile device. There's no gadgets or any kind of wearable sensors intruding on your good night's sleep. 
Bedit monitors your vitals and sleep cycles to assess your sleep quality. Sleep affects your overall wellness. During deep sleep, you and your body recover so that you'd be able to perform during daytime. Bedit also gives you tips on improving your sleep quality and offers helpful features like the smart alarm that wakes you up at the optimal time so that you could feel refreshed and energized when waking up. Every morning, the Bedit mobile application gives you an overall assessment of your sleep quality and gives you tips on improving your sleep and wellness. Remember, sleep smart, live better, bed it. So I hope you can see the minor difference between those two videos. So since we started sipping the product in January 2014, we've sipped over 100,000 units to consumers. Uh, we are in about 3,000 stores, including some of the most prestigious channels in the world. We are available worldwide in Apple stores, and also they're, they're online. So where we are now, we still have a 17 people in the team. We have raised our seed round for this, but the leak where we are right now, there are six products, six third-party wellness products in Apple store. We are one of them. And there are a lot of people globally who started to recognize that there is a sleep tracking brand called Pedit. And we are not going to stop here. Even already with these very little resources and uh, where we're coming from with our background, we have achieved quite a lot. But we're definitely not going to stay there. So right now, we are in the business of sleep tracking, which is niche market of 100 million, growing fast, but still a small market. There is a big wearable market out there, including Fitbit, Jawbone, Apple Watch, Samsung watches, all that. So we are going to enter that market in a way that we are enabling sleep tracking for Apple Watch so that we can increase our user base, that the users who have Apple Watch around the world can track their sleep with the watch. There is also a big market this bedding industry. So bedding industry is moving into this field. So bed manufacturers, mattress manufacturers, seat manufacturers have started to integrate monitoring technology into their products. And many of them are going to integrate bedded technology into their products. So next time when you go to buy a bed or a mattress, it will most likely be capable of tracking your health and your sleep and hopefully, it will have the bedded technology in that bed. So already some examples that we have launched, and we are getting more and more of these into the market. We are now in, uh, we have a one integration in, in, uh, in France, one in Finland, one in Germany, one just starting in Australia. We operate, we're working with many in the United States. And like said, we're going to enable sleep tracking for Apple Watch. Right now, Apple Watch can track everything you need, your activity, uh, your heart, during the daytime. But when you go to bed, it's, you need to charge that, uh, that, phone, uh, that uh, watch. And during that time, Bedit continues to track your sleep in your bed. And uh, you can use the watch as an interface to look at those results. So this is going to change. So in the future, also, Apple Watch will be able to track your sleep during the night. And we will be the one enabling that. Even beyond that, we are the only product which is clinically validated to make a transition from the hardware, from the product sales, to the hardware as a service business. So what we are able to do, you think about that the Fitbit, Showbone, wearable market is big. At the moment, it's a three billion market. When thinking about one sleeping disorder, sleep apnea, diagnostics and treatment of one sleeping disorder, sleep apnea, is over twice of the market size of the, all the wearables at the moment. Obviously, wearables are getting bigger, but think about the possibility if this is the current state of the art, if you are suspecting that you have a sleeping disorder, this is what you need, and this is how much it costs. And this is what it's going to be in a couple of years, and we are raising now a growth round to achieve this and make the transition from the product sale 
to hardware as a service business. So you're welcome to visit our stand, see how the Pedit works, talk more and get your own Pedit with a discounted price. So that's the only way how you're going to get good sleep during slush. Thank you. What would you do realizing that the $200 billion industry you work in is nearly untouched by modern technology? I'm sure you would start to think about improvements. I'm sure you would feel the rush grasping the potential of adding information technology. I'm sure you would have quit your job just as I did and ended up here. My name is Patrick Berglin. I used to work with business development at one of the world's leading, leading logistics companies. Now, I'm CEO of Zanetta, and we're about to change the business of global logistics forever. Think about it. 70% of all global trade is being moved on containers on ships. Containerized ocean freight is the main artery of the global economy. The industry provides infrastructure to our man-made physical world. It affects everybody and enables our way of life. Look around you. The lamps, the chairs, your clothes. Practically everything you see in this room has been inside a container. With great size comes great complexity. Most of you probably see an endless pile of rusty containers. I? I see an industry that since the 60s, when the container uh, revolutionized global trade, has grown on average every year with 10%. Today, there's 6,000 vessels, 18 million containers, and more than 300 million container movements. What has really gotten to me is the fact that behind each and every one of these movements, there's several business transactions, negotiated contracts, budgeting, complex forecasting, and so forth. So what's the problem? Well, imagine me as a young professional entering this old-fashioned industry. I was used to Google my answers. Massive amounts of data was generated constantly throughout the industry, but it was out of reach to me. The whole industry was stuck in spreadsheets, static, disconnected, outdated. Even faxes were used. The lack of proper business intelligence was appalling. It was literally impossible to know whether a price was good or bad. A fundamental quality of any functional market is transparency. So we decided to connect the dots and build a whole new platform transforming the underlying business processes of the industry. By now, our platform represents the big data of global ocean freight. It provides everyone with the chance to improve their business. We're enabling smarter decisions based on facts. In the words of one of our customers today, before Sonera, I was left in the dark. This is how we do it. To get hold of the data, we reached out to the companies that lacked information the most. The buyers, the customers of the logistics companies, the ones shipping their sporting goods, chemicals, or, or electronics all over the world. The platform is built on business-to-business -business crowdsourcing. We allow companies to compare their own contracted prices with peers in a standardized way. Before. The power of information used to rest with the logistics companies. Now, we have empowered the buyers. And what's really interesting is that as soon as the buyers started to embrace our platform, others started to follow. Because the Netta works and grows due to the self-interest of all stakeholders. And we bring transparency and efficiency 
to the industry. So it's an era. For the first time ever, everyone gets access to real-time market intelligence. Stakeholders can make decisions based on fact, smarter decisions. A typical customer of Sonera would be a large global company shipping containers all around the world in the thousands, spending millions of dollars on ocean freight annually. Being able, being able to see their own spend relative to the real market, they're now able to answer questions such as, how much do I overpay and where can I find savings? Which suppliers are ripping me off? How big are my improvement potentials? With one click, they can measure their performance and take action. So how is this working out for us? Well, we've effectively established a digital neutral ground for the whole industry. Already, our customers span from the world's largest aluminum producer to the hottest electrical car manufacturer. We are the world's largest ocean freight intelligence platform, and we're growing fast. Today, our users have uploaded more than 10 million contracted prices into our platform, and our coverage has exploded. Today, we deliver intelligence on more than 60,000 trade routes all over the world. And by the end of this year, we'll finally have full global coverage. And that's a massive milestone for us. We could stop here, continue building our business on ocean freight. But our ambitions are far greater, and the network our customers form with our technology is the perfect match for us to tap into different logistics services, like air freight, road freight, or rail freight. We're eager to change the underlying business processes of all modes of transportation, enable functional markets, make them fully transparent, improve cost efficiency, and in turn, impact global economy. In fact, there's a whole ecosystem around that's already started to leverage our platform to improve their businesses. Consider the magnitude of these markets and the central role of the industry in global trade. Our platform sits right in the core of it all. This landscape turns over trillions of dollars. We brought on board a passionate and ambitious team, and I'm stoked to keep the excitement and success pumping on our awesome journey. If you see the same potentials here as we do, please come and embark on our voyage. Thank you, and bon voyage. Hi, everyone. I'm the founder and CEO of Falcon Social. Uh, we are a SaaS vendor, uh, basically helping larger brands manage their presence in social. Um, so what does that mean? It's basically a pretty complex and increasingly fragmented exercise for these brands to uh, really manage what has changed consumer behavior. So, all of you guys are on your various devices. You talk about brands, you love them, you badmouth them, you trash them. You do all kinds of things in seemingly sort of constantly changing uh, uh, touch points and networks, be it on social media, be it on messaging apps and whatnot. Basically, the only constant is the volume and the increase of the interactions and the mentions and the extreme fragmentations of where all this stuff is happening. So that's very, very difficult for marketers to, to get their head around. And you know, a lot of people have been building technology to try and fix this. This was how the marketing tech space looked in 2013. And what happened in the meantime was that a lot of seed stage investors got really trigger happy. And this is the 2015 slide. 
So it has not gotten any easier for these brands to understand uh, which tools to pick and choose and how to stitch them together to build something that really works for them. So what we've been doing is to take some core use cases and say, these things got to work, and they got to work under one roof in one tool uh, that will solve the problem. So we have the capability to listen to what people are saying about your brand. If it's terrible or wonderful, you can reach out and uh, mitigate or amplify that conversation. And you can put out your own content. Um, you can have analytics around that, a governance model. So basically, you understand you know, who in your organization has the password to the Twitter account. Are they still employed? And other uh, important things. So a lot of people have been saying you know, nice things about us. Uh, I think the most important uh, uh, sort of indicator of success is the growth that we've seen. So, since being just a handful of employees being bootstrapped since 2000 and, and uh, up until 2012, we've seen some very rapid growth, having raised three rounds of funding and are now more than 200 people in, in four offices uh, building and rolling out this thing. Um, this is our actual uh, MRR, monthly recurring revenue ramp, in the first two years of operation. And um, it speaks volumes about you know, how, our, how our customers and how the market is responding to what we're doing. Um, in the interest of additional transparency, this is what SaaS uh, executives uh, want to see. This is the cohorts of the individual uh, customers as they came on board, whether or not they're growing or contracting. And uh, we're, we're doing pretty good uh, in, that, uh, in that arena as well. So what's next for a tool like ours, who has, you know, we've gone pretty broad in terms of having a lot of capabilities under one roof. And so the really meaningful thing that's happening uh, in, in social is that it is so incredibly data rich. And that's what we're doubling down on. So, uh, you know, what, what's really happening is that there are so many different data sources uh, in social that we're coalescing and joining up uh, to build something that's very, very interesting. So people are using our tool to listen about what's being said. They have interactions specifically with, with, uh, with certain, uh, certain individuals. And they put out content, and they integrate to internal systems. And really what happens is that we basically you know, have the components and the ingredients to build that fabled unified view of the customer, at least a very large portion of it. This is basically what the CRM guys uh, you know, had on their slides for the last 10 years. And they never delivered. They delivered jack on the premise of you know, joining up these things and building something that at least it's getting close to the unified view of the customer. We're doing that. We are looking at uh, the, the customer at an atomic level, on the individual level, providing really, really uh, strong and rich profiles when you do one-to-one -one interactions in terms of customer service. Um, and that's really important if you want to uh, you know, accommodate the modern consumer in terms of you know, providing value and providing a conversation that seems engaging and, and is not just uh, bland marketing or, or run-of-the-mill templated responses on social. So this is really key. It's a key component in a modern way to engage with customers. But interestingly enough, if you start looking at this at an aggregate level, then you will understand uh, which segments very specifically which segments of your, uh, of, of your customers, of your prospects, of people who are talking about you, that you will be able to have specific conversations with. You'll be able to, as you employ this type of operation, to go in and do custom audiences, do lookalike audiences, do retargeting, based on all the data that comes back by just using a modern customer engagement or customer experience platform. I think. What, what's happening here is that a lot of things are coming together that even Gardner and Forrester haven't come up with the right names for yet. And um, that's what we're building. That's what we're incredibly excited about. We have north of 600 customers enjoying um, what we're doing. And um, that's basically what I had to show you guys today. Cheers.
Hey guys, it feels amazingly good to be back here on stage on the main stage here at Slash again. Because last time I was here, a couple of years ago, I was pitching Fishbrain and won the pitching competition. So it's extraordinary to be back here on stage. And I really owe it to, uh, to Slash for being here today. So Fishbrain, who is Fishbrain? Fishbrain is the social app and social platform for the works by far absolutely biggest hobby. Sport fishing. Globally, half a billion people fish. 500 million people fish. That is more than play golf and tennis combined. 60 million people fish in the States alone. 22 million people play golf. 10 million people play tennis. 60 million people fish in the States. So it's huge. And the industry, the sport fishing industry, it's a, it's a $48 billion industry in the US alone, which is roughly three times the global music industry. So anglers are crazy about spending money and spending time on their passion, on their hobby. Meet Mark. Mark is 40 years old. He lives in Tampa, Florida, and he loves fishing. This is not very uncommon because this is the most popular sport in entire Florida. But Mark, he has a big problem. All his friends catch more and bigger fish than him. And he thinks that sucks. Luckily for him, Fishbrain is here to help him out. So let me show you how. No, I didn't, because the, the video didn't work. But so just to give you a couple of examples. So with Fishbrain, Mark can find out when, where, and how to go fishing. So he can catch more and bigger fish. He can explore new waters, where to go, so he can catch more and bigger fish. He can follow friends, he can follow pros on Fishbrain. And he can brag, this is super important, he can brag about his catches, which is a big part of Fishbrain, because anglers, they want to brag about their catches. So this is what you can do on Fishbrain today already. But what you've seen so far here, this is just the beginning for Fishbrain. Because we want to be the entire platform for everything sport fishing. So we want to make sure that Mark can buy and sell stuff, rent boats, find charter boats, buy fishing licenses, upload and watch videos. There are millions of videos, sport fishing videos on YouTube today. Compete. There are lots of competitions, especially in Florida in the States, sport fishing tournaments. So we will add use cases to Fishbrain as we go. So it's just the beginning for us right now. So how are we doing? This is a couple of years after winning the pitching competition here. <coughs> I think we do pretty well. We got a million and a half registered users already. This is, we've not been in the business for very long. <coughs> we are, this makes us number one globally. So we are, we are the fastest growing. We grow roughly five times faster than the second biggest one, and we're the biggest in the States. We have users in 206 countries. When I checked yesterday, that's the same number United Nations has for recognized countries. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we have users in all, every country in the world. Our users, our user base, have logged 650,000 catches already on Fishbrain. This makes things the world's largest database of catches. And thanks to that, we can start doing some really, really, really cool stuff. Because for every catch that is logged, uh, we collect like 15 different uh, parameters, like water temperature, air temperature, wind speed, wind direction, and all that stuff. And using machine learning, we can actually, for the first time ever, come up with a recommendation of forecast when is a good time to go fishing if you want to catch a pike or if you want to catch a perch or given species. So we're the first one to do that. Now I want to show you some of the amazing monster catches that have been logged already on Fishbrain. Look at this one here. This is a Goliath grouper. That's a pretty nice fish. Uh, this is a yellowfin tuna. This is a 273 kilo fish. It's quite massive, right? Uh, you have a lake sturgeon, which is one of those l huge ones there. Next one here. This is a pretty beautiful, beautiful one, red, colorful picture. We have a lot of amazingly good pictures on Fishbrain. 
And the final one here, this, this species is called alligator gar, which is a hybrid between a fish and an alligator. They are really, really, really scary. They have enormous amount of teeth. And they jump into the water to take picture with the fish. And the guy over there, uh, he's called Jeremy Wade. And he's a celebrity. He, <laughs> he has a show on Discovery Channel called River Monsters, where he goes fishing for those uh, scary fish with a lot of teeth. So there are some examples of the catches that have been logged already on Fishbrain. So myself, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I lived in the valley for many years. But I've never been with a company where it's been so easy to get publicity, to get some really good buzz going. We've been in uh, New York Times, Financial Times, Bloomberg, Telegraph. I've been on CNBC. And recently, when Wired launched their <coughs> the list of the hottest companies in Europe, we were on the list. And they, they, it, they'd spent hours taking that picture. It was a lot of fun. And right before the summer, uh, we raised an $8 million A round. It was led by North Zone, an active venture partner. So now we really put the pedal to the metal to grow this, uh, grow this user base. And the plan for us right now is to, we want to become not just the app and the social network. We want to become the platform for everything sport fishing. So we want to be Mark's everyday app. Everything's related to sport fishing he should do on Fishbrain. So we want to become the platform we want to dominate the states. We're building a social network, so the dynamic is winner takes it all. There will be one winner, everyone else will be a loser. We want to be the winner. We should be the winner. We will be the winner. So we're working on that. After we've done that, we want to expand to other markets where sport fishing is huge. Japan, we have a Japanese investor recruit on board now. Brazil, China, and Russia, all markets where sport fishing is really, really big. And now it's the time for us. We have a big enough user base. It's time for us to start monetizing. And before I end, I want to say that we are hiring. So please come join, uh, come join Fishbrain. And uh, today, <laughs> the city of Stockholm is launching a new hashtag uh, called Move to Stockholm, where you can find out about the... Uh, Stockholm is an amazingly good city to live. And I lived in the valley, I lived in, in Boston, so I think my bar for quality of life is set pretty, uh, pretty high. But if you look at this hashtag, you can find out uh, great things about Stockholm, uh, the startups there, and open positions uh, within the startup ecosystem. But make sure you apply to Fishbrain first. Thank you, and hope I can hook you. <laughs> Thank you, guys.